Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. So after doing uh, the uh, fix-up on this TRS-80 Model 3, and that was a few episodes ago where it came back from the dead, I started to actually use this and uh, as promised to play Zork on it. And uh, I went through it, I cleaned up the dust and the dirt and the grime and uh, I made sure that wires were routed nicely. Found an interesting one in the uh, harness going to disk drive power. That wire with the electrical tape on it was rubbed clear through and showing copper. Now it turned out to be uh, it's the ground wire. That's why there were no sparks flying, but uh, that was still a good thing to find, which would have uh, probably caused me hours and hours of searching time to find uh, if it touched the wrong place. But anyway, so uh, it's kind of cleaner inside now. The monitor's removed for easier access. And uh, I then got started as my uh, cleanup continued to have a look at the motherboard, which is of course in the back here. And uh, so let's open this up because uh, I caused myself a bit of a problem with this. And I'll show you what I did to fix it. I removed the RF shield and just had a quick visual inspection, even though this was working, to make sure everything was in order. It looked like it was. And uh, I put the shield back, turned it around, turned on the machine, and was greeted with garbage on the screen. The machine wouldn't boot up no matter what I did. Now, uh, one slight fact I neglected to mention was that when I was looking at this board, I noticed that a whole bunch of the mounting screws were missing. Basically, all we had... That's not good. There's a... Uh, there were three screws, one, two, and three, and there were like five more screws that were supposed to hold this in place solidly, and they were missing. Of course, I went in and replaced the screws, and uh, that's what turned out to be the problem that uh, caused this not to boot up. And uh, let's have a look at exactly what caused this. This is a really shoddy design flaw, I would say, and uh, that of course explained to me why the board was only held in place with three screws, because somebody had probably inserted the other, the remaining screws, found that the board didn't come up, and by trial and error went, oh, if I leave these screws out, everything will work, but the board's flapping around in there, and uh, that's not the way to do it. Well, let's see what happened. So here's the back with the uh, main CPU board out of the way. And uh, we can see the uh, floppy controller on the left and the serial board on the right, which are right underneath it. Now the way this board is mounted, let's see if I can give you a somewhat clear picture of that. It's basically these are the screw mounting holes. And notice how the edges over here are bent outwards towards the uh, towards the uh, board. And what happened here, I guess this was the offending one on the bottom, was when those screws were tightened really well, then the uh, flaps on the mounts uh, these flaps, basically, since they were pointing towards the board, pierced the board. And in most cases, that didn't make a difference. But uh, on the middle lower screw, it actually pierced through a trace. And since this frame is grounded, it just grounded the trace. And uh, voila, nothing worked. So what I did was I created... 
I created these rectangular donuts out of 3M double-sided double fat tape and put them on every mounting hole and then put things back in, being careful not to uh, tighten the screws too, tighten them, but not tighten them too much. And uh, the spacing or the, the depth of these of this tape then prevented any more shorting from happening and the machine booted right up. So uh, let's make sure that it still boots up. And there you go, everything is back in uh, great shape. Let's run the directory. See how it had a problem reading it? So normally, if you repeat that, and it fails again and uh, this is going to lead us to a discussion about floppy disks let me give it one more chance now all of a sudden it works But that's not the fault of the uh, CPU board. And uh, I venture to say it's not the fault of the actual disk drive either. But I think it's the floppies themselves. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's continue this uh, with me actually having cleaned it up, found the problem on the CPU board, put it back together, and... Uh, started on sessions of playing some more games. About an hour or two later, I was really having a good time with this thing, uh, I put in a new disc, turned it on, and uh, I heard the characteristic whistle of a switched mode power supply going bad and nothing happened. Now if I let it sit, if I switched the machine on and off a few times, it would eventually boot and the uh, high-pitched noise from the uh, power supply would disappear but obviously that was a problem in there there's the power supply which uh, I did a visual inspection on and uh, see that blue cap over there well what was in its place was this and uh, while it was still mounted in the board, you could see that the top was bulging ever so slightly. And uh, I pulled it out, and looking at the other end of it, it had bulged pretty badly on the bottom and was leaking. So this guy was obviously bad. It was an easy replacement to... Uh, Let's see, get him out, that guy right, the blue guy right in the middle of the picture, put a new one in, and the whistling disappeared and everything worked nice from now on. And then as I continued, I started seeing problems with the disc I'd, I'd made, like you saw before. The discs were completely inconsistent. God, this, this capacitor smells bad. I couldn't figure out where the bad smell was coming from. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, needs to be, this needs to be all recapped. But I'm not a firm believer in let's just rip things out and replace them. As long as it's running, 
I don't know, it was a quick fix and it's working fine, and eventually I'll have to recap the power supply, but not right now. But back to the floppies, I started to see some really inconsistent behavior. Uh, I mean, there's two problems, and uh, they are unrelated. The first problem I found was that even though I could format and copy to each of these drives just fine, but uh, what would happen is the disks were not interchangeable. Now, disks that were made uh, on a PC using some old-style DOS tools did read fine in drive 0, the one on the bottom, but they wouldn't read in drive 1. And uh, it would let me format something in drive 1 and write OS's to it from the TRS, but then when I put the newly written disk from drive 1 into drive 0, drive 0 couldn't read it. Since Drive Zero was able to read disks made on another disk drive, on, a, on an older PC, uh, the, uh, that led me to believe that the alignment on Drive One was off. It was either the alignment or the Track Zero switch, and the Track Zero switch is kind of wonky. It's supposed to kick in between Tracks 2 and 3, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, and uh, I tried to adjust it, I don't know if the switch is bad, or it's going, or the mounting. I have no idea, and for somebody who can't even drill a straight hole with a drill press, myself that is, uh, I wasn't going to completely go in and tweak things in the drive and destroy it completely. So, what the next thing to do was finding alternate ways of adding store external storage to this computer. The second problem with the disk drives, which I referred to earlier, is I have the sneaking suspicion that uh, at least five the magnetic media on five and a quarter inch uh, floppies themselves, they are about 30 plus years old, uh, something in there is beginning to disintegrate. And that's why they're, they format fine, you can write them, read them, play with them for a while, and then all of a sudden they start losing data. And uh, my theory of that is, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the uh, dipoles on, on, in the media are getting confused or getting stuck. I know that sounds kind of stupid, but one thing that I found was, if you use a, uh, well, this one is, is, is called a tape eraser. It's basically a big-ass electromagnet that gets activated when you hit the switch. It's used, uh, or was used, to erase VHS tapes because it aligns all of the uh, dipoles and pretty much wipes out whatever patterns you had. And these can be used on floppy disks too. They do the same thing. And a vigorous application of one of these, you basically hold it over the floppy and move it around, usually does provide some improvement. The disk seems to come come back to life. You can format it, you can read and write it for a while, but then the disk disintegrates again. The, uh, the media disintegrates, it's starting to have write problems, read problems, and things just go bad. So, as I said before, I think that uh, the actual media is to blame here for that happening, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about that. That's just, uh, I guess, uh, floppy drives are just coming to end of life. I, I have not seen the same problem with reel-to-reel -reel tapes, which still seem to work uh, fine. And uh, I would think that the media, the, the composition of the media would be somewhat similar between floppies and reel-to-reel, uh, -reel, which it probably isn't, but leave me a comment and let me know. But my conclusion at this point is is that five and a quarter inch floppies are uh, nearing the end of life uh, because a lot of the discs I used were brand new coming out of sealed boxes that I had uh, been hanging on to for years. And uh, most of them seem to just disintegrate. Some of them are doing fine, but uh, a majority of them are just completely unreliable. So let's look at what else we can do. First thing that came to mind was a PC 3.5 inch drive with a capacity of 1.44 megs. 
The uh, problem with this is that the drives in the TRS-80 follow the uh, Shugart interface spec and the PC drive, even though it's very close, in uh, electronics very close isn't good enough. There are some signals that need to be rerouted. So uh, we need something like a breakout box to connect the uh, 3.5 inch drive to the TRS-80. Now the TRS-80 supports up to four drives, the two internal ones, and the external ones uh, come out on a ribbon cable from underneath the computer, which is very inconvenient because you've got to lift this thing and plug it, plug it in and the cable gets tangled up and all of that. But uh, what we end up with is a 34-pin connector that brings out the uh, Shugart signals from the from the uh, TRS-80, but again we need some sort of a breakout box to be able to reroute the signals uh, so it talks properly to the 3.5 inch drive. So here's basically what needs to be done. On the left we can see the uh, signals, floppy signals coming out of the uh, Model 3 on the uh, 34 pin connector. The, e, the odd numbered pins are all grounded, so uh, uh, so half half the connector is actually wasted on ground, and the other end has the actual signals. You can see that uh, all the signals on the left with a green X next to them mean that uh, they shouldn't be connected. The uh, dotted lines mean that they should be connected straight through because the pins match up between the PC and the Model 3. And really when all is said and done, the only real modifications are on the PC, pin 2 is a density select, and uh, the drive I'm using is a Sony drive, and uh, when you pull that pin low, it basically works in double density rather than in, uh, in high density, and uh, that's what we want uh, for the TRS-80 to be, to be able to read and write to, and then we can see the only other extra wire is pin 10, that's the select zero line or drive select zero line coming out of the uh, uh, out of the model three, and that is wired to the select one line uh, on the drive. And on pin sixteen, there's a motor on signal. Uh, the TRS-80 has a single motor on signal, whereas the PC has two motor on signals. But the motor on signal goes straight to the motor B select on the PC drive, and uh, why are we going to select 1 and motor B rather than motor A and select 0, and the reason for that is is most of the uh, drives you get out of PCs are factory uh, are factory hardwired to be uh, drive 1 because of the twisted cable on PCs and all of that, so rather than making you forget that and not see drives work, I decided to wire it like this because most of my drives come out of old PCs and that way uh, I don't have to open up the uh, three and a half inch drive and uh, modify that. Here's the breakout box and uh, it took a bit of experimentation for me to come up with a proper working uh, device. That's why you'll see some extra things on this board that really aren't necessary. On the left there's a 14 pin socket and what I used that for was when things weren't working, I was suspecting that maybe I need a uh, need a pull-up resistor pack because all of the uh, drive signals coming out of the TRS-80 are coming out of open collector and uh, buffers, and there are no pull-ups on the TRS-80 on the uh, drive two and three connector and I was thinking that that was a problem, but basically it ends up that after doing some measuring that uh, the signals are already pulled up on the 3.5 inch drive, so that wasn't necessary. And the power connection you see on the right, the only purpose for that was I needed 5 volt power to be able for the uh, pull-ups to work, and since I'm not using pull-ups anymore, I don't need that either. So, uh, kind of uh, ignore the wires coming out of the right and uh, the socket on the left, it's not necessary. 
This was uh, basically made using modern wire wrap technologies and uh, it just follows the diagram that uh, I showed you previously connecting the wires and things will get a little bit cleaner if I go in and remove the power connection and the uh, socket for the pull-ups. But that is the actual breakout part and uh, after all was said and done, as we could see from the last diagram I showed you, uh, we really, th there's two wires that don't go straight through, other than of course the wires that are not used on the TRS-80, but one is grounding the uh, density select and the other one is rerouting the uh, select zero signal. Here's everything hooked up. The uh, top connector comes straight out of the expansion connector from the uh, Model 3 and uh, the bottom cable goes to the uh, 3.5 inch drive. It is a Sony MPF920 which uh, they made tons and tons and tons of. I haven't tested this particularly with any other drive yet because the Sony's are pretty much what I have but there's no reason why another drive shouldn't work. So uh, let's give it a disc. I have uh, TRS-DOS uh, loaded and what we do here is like an all-in-one thing we're going to tell it to back up and uh, source drive number is of course zero which is the internal first drive destination drive now is number two and uh, source disk master password Radio Shack was very security conscious. This get contains data, use disk or not. Yes, it's talking about the uh, three and a half inch disk. Do you wish to reformat? Yes. Now notice, of course, it's going TRS DOS will format this in double density single sided 40 tracks. Uh, TRS DOS doesn't really have any options to change any of that. So we can see it format. The drive is live, I can hear it stepping. And it's not the fastest in the world. It's done. I was able to format it, no flawed tracks, and copy over the system. And uh, let's see if we can do anything simple, like just running a directory off drive number 2. And there you go. See, it did actually read drive 2 and it didn't hiccup or anything. The uh, interesting thing was that this will actually work un unaltered. Right now, uh, as I said, the uh, line coming from the TRS-80 is coming from a connector underneath the computer. And the only difference between that and the internal connector is, is that the internal connector selects the drives 0 and 1 and the external connector selects drives 2 and 3. So uh, what you can do is take that connector that's connected externally right now, uh, tear the machine apart and plug that connector into the uh, internal connector, which is a 34 pin edge connector. And uh, I'm not going to repeat that because it takes quite some time to take everything apart. And I'm afraid there's some flex connectors in here that are beginning to look old and I'm afraid uh, if I open this up and close it down too many times I'm going to uh, damage the flex connectors and uh, then have to hardwire things or come up with another way so uh, forgive me for not doing it but uh, take my word for it when you plug this guy in now after he's been formatted and start up uh, the uh, TRS-80 it will boot off of 
the uh, three and a half inch drive. We're still dealing with old magnetic media, but let me tell you, uh, I have seen far fewer floppy disk failures with three and a half inch uh, magnetic media than the five and a quarter inch. And I mean far, far fewer. So uh, I'm sure the composition of the material used, especially on high density disks, is of a much better quality than it was on five and a quarter inch drives. And uh, so this is one option that we could uh, consider. The problem with this is mostly of a mechanical nature. I mean, if we're going to mount this as drive zero, it's going to have to be mounted in here somehow. And uh, it's going to look really, really ghetto unless uh, I build like a custom faceplate that's a full height five and a quarter. And then that has a cutout for this drive to go in. And then the faceplate of this would be replaced with a black faceplate. And, and the machine would look completely unoriginal. So uh, for now, let, let it just be an engineering experiment, uh, experiment that proves that uh, three and a half inch drives will work just great on a TRS-80. With TRS-DOS, there really isn't good utilization of the capacity of this. TRS-DOS does uh, 40 track single-sided dual density, which results in about 180k use of this, but uh, even using a double density disc in here, it has a capacity of 720k. So uh, I was thinking uh, the way to reach that is to use another DOS, which is LDOS, and just tell it to format 80 tracks double-sided. So it's in the middle, it formatted the whole thing, it is trying to uh, verify it now, which is going to take a while, but that should basically give us 720k, and uh, I did, uh, and while I was testing a TRS DOS diskette connected to the internal connector on this, I already tried this and made a 720k disk and backed up LDOS to it and uh, LDOS basically booted from the 720k disk. So it's a viable uh, it's a viable alternative to using the uh, full height five and a quarter inch drives but as I said there's a thin line between keeping the machine original and making it more functional. And I'm still at a point where this is just being made out of curiosity because I don't need more function out of this machine. I just want it to be original and uh, I would really like it to work as it did originally. So uh, let's see what capacity it will report once it's done formatting this. It's initializing the directory. And we're done. So if I run a directory on it now, so uh, yeah, it identifies it as a 720k diskette with 709.5 uh, K free space. So there you have it. Uh, quadruple the uh, capacity of the internal drives and you can boot off it too. Here's yet another option which uh, my opinion is a lot cooler than using a physical uh, floppy drive. It's the HXC floppy disk emulator and uh, what it does is it emulates a floppy drive using the uh, PIC 18F 4620. Uh, the only other thing of note is a 74LS38 over here which is a quad NAND gate with open collector outputs which most likely handles line termination as required because this is configurable to mimic uh, different types of interfaces, different types of floppy interfaces, most notably 
uh, of a PC drive and of a Shogart drive, as we saw before. Uh, got a beeper on it, some lights, buttons for the user interface, and a contrast adjustment, and assorted jelly bean items on there, and that's about it. But uh, what, uh, what I left out was it also comes with an LCD display, which conveniently plugs in over the uh, processor, and uh, uh, it's plugged in just like a floppy drive using the 34-pin uh, cable, IDE cable. Uh, it has a power, external power connector because the floppy bus doesn't carry any power, and uh, it, it doesn't have serial com or USB or anything on it, not this model. Uh, you basically put everything on an SD card. It's interesting to note that with a 32 gigabyte SD card and assuming you're holding full disk images, which are 180K, uh, you can put about 170,000 images, disk images, on here. Uh, that is quite a lot of storage for the TRS-80. Of course, that poses a bit of a nightmare with the user interface because a 16-character uh, by 2-line display is not going to lend itself well to uh, scanning through thousands of uh, disk images. So you'd probably be better off using smaller SD cards uh, to keep your files better organized and more accessible. But uh, when we plug this guy in, the plug is being... Well, the plug just didn't want to go in, but here you go, and what it really does is it has a configuration file on the uh, on the SD card that it reads and uh, configures the board for what it emulates, and then it has a bunch of image uh, image files which end uh, with the HFE extension, and at that point you basically uh, you can scroll through through what you got on the disk, or using left and right, and that's what I'm saying why I'm saying it. It is kind of, uh, it's going to be very cumbersome if you got, I'm not even saying thousands or hundreds, even tens of files. You basically got to go th sc uh, scroll through them in a linear fashion until you find the one you want. But, uh, so let's, let's see, what do I have? If I check the floppy, I do have an LDOS disk in the floppy. So let us select an LDOS image. So uh, there's an LDOS image, and uh, all we got to do now is turn on the machine. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm actually, I need to boot uh, LDOS on the computer. Uh, but as I said before, you can actually hook this up into the uh, internal bus on the TRS-80 and it will boot off of this. So, uh, as usual, now I'm being asked for the date and time. And it won't let you shortcut the date like on PCs. You can't just on LDOS hit enter and have it go to January 1st, 1980 or so. It insists on you typing in a valid date uh, after 1980. But what it's telling us now, it is sitting on track 6, and uh, it has track 6 of 40 tracks. So now under LDOS, let's run a directory on, on that drive. So it went ahead 
and uh, went and it sought out. I guess LDOS uses uh, uses track twenty to hold the uh, directory information. But uh, let's see what we found there. And the reason I'm using this is I finally found some games, some really, really fine games, uh, arcade games for the TRS-80, rather than uh, adventures written in BASIC. So let's have a look and see what these games look like. So here's our choice of games, and uh, even better than that, uh, some of them even have sound. And the way that works is uh, the programmers utilized the uh, cassette interface, the output that normally writes data to the cassette, and it just generates square waves just like a really old PC. So uh, pick a game. Which one do you want to see? Uh, let's do Galaxy Plus. Those buzzes. So there you go. Those buzzes you heard was basically the uh, HXC st uh, simulating uh, diskette stepping sounds, but it loaded nice and quickly. And uh, one of the problems I have, of course, is that most of these games use the left and right angle bracket to move your ship, and. Uh, as you may remember, I'm moving. I'm uh, missing the uh, right angle bracket, but so it goes into demo mode. And let's see, what do you have to press to start a game? Okay, you have to press clear. It's Galaxian. Essentially, this was state of the art arcade gaming because an unmodified the TRS 80, even the Model 3, couldn't show. I mean, those little blocks you see, like uh, the size of a missile, that is your the highest resolution you can get out of it. But here's what that looks like for you. And uh, if we want to go and have a look at another game, I don't think there's an easy way to clear break. But there's no way to exit the game. So we need to reboot. Please remember the date. It's not remembering the date. So. And we can run another directory on two. So, uh, what did you say I wanted to see? Meteor? Okay. Meteor Mission 2 it is, and uh, I don't even know what this is, but... Oh, this is like a... This is like a lunar lander. But I didn't read the instructions, so I don't know what I have to hit to start descending. Ah, there you go. No, 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 no. You get the idea, and uh, there's also something, I think there's actually something useful on this disc too. Remember the date this time. I think there's like a disc zapping utility on here. Oh no, Super Utility 3. Yes. 
Oh, it's still reading it. This is a big one. But as you can see, there's all sorts of utilities on here for discs, for tape. It'll do your memory checks and and it'll just do lots of neat stuff. So uh, this is uh, this is an image. I actually found an entire HFE image online that I didn't have to convert, but uh, the uh, HXC comes with a PC-based program that'll let you take DSK images or any kind of emulated images and uh, put them and turn them into the HFE format to put onto onto the SD card. This device works really, really well. I bought this several years ago. I think it cost about a hundred dollars. It hasn't really gone up that much. They still sell this. They actually sell it with a case now. And they also have a, uh, a USB version, which would mitigate the uh, UI, uh, the UI nightmare when you have many, many uh, disk images on here. But of course, you know, you need to have a laptop sitting next to it to be able to... I think that's the way it works because uh, the USB version didn't look like it had any display on it and so it would use a host uh, to, do, to do everything. But we're suffering from the same problem here as we did with the uh, three and a half inch drive because this looks, this looks pretty bad. I mean, if, again, you'd have to cut a custom front panel where the uh, where the LCD pokes through and the buttons poke through, but the way this is mounted is the LCD is a lot higher than the buttons, so uh, you would have to uh, butcher this thing, bring uh, bring out the buttons so they're at the same level as the LCD, and you could probably spend uh, uh, the better part of a weekend trying to figure the layout out and trying to cut a uh, a plastic plate or an aluminum plate to go in there. Again, it's nice to know this, this option exists, but uh, to me it is still more important to keep the uh, TRS-80 uh, in as much of an original condition as possible. To, uh, the one thing that, I've, uh, that I alluded to and uh, I haven't really talked about is how did I originally make floppies for this? And in order to actually make floppies for this, uh, some software exists that you can run on an older PC uh, and uh, actually write the image on an older PC to a, a 360K PC drive and uh, it kind of works. I don't have a 360K drive yet. I created this disk using a 1.2 meg disk and again with all of the uh, floppy issues that I complained about it is kind of hit, hit or miss using a high density floppy drive uh, and uh, I've, from what I've read is once you have an actual 360k drive it's a piece of cake but uh, until I have that drive and until I have a PC an old enough PC to run that software under, under MS-DOS uh, I think we'll leave that to another episode but here we are with the uh, current with the current state of the uh, TRS-80 Model 3. So let me know what you think of this and uh, give me a thumbs up if uh, this was fun for you and you, and or you definitely want to see how I use a uh, an older PC such as a PC <clears throat> a PC XT or a PC AT to create the uh, files for this and make sure to subscribe. We'll see you soon.